from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. This is episode 197 of the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. This is my recorded presentation for Fly Fishing for Shad on the Tidal Potomac River, which can apply to other rivers up and down the East Coast. That was given at the Orvis Store of Tyson's Corner in March of 2018. There's some updated information and flies from previous readings on Fly Fishing for Shad. I hope you enjoy this one. And this podcast is brought to you by Speedwell Law. Are you a resident of Virginia and thinking about retiring in the next five years? Do you have your will in order? Speedwell Law offers flat rate estate planning packages that include the most important documents to ensure you and your family receive the care and support you need from people you love and trust. From now through the end of April 2018, Speedwell Law is offering free advanced medical directive consultation. Call Misha Gill with Speedwell Law at 703-553-2577 to get started. You can find Speedwell Law online at speedwelllaw.com, S-P-E-E-D-W-E-L-L-L-A-W.com. And to continue the spring fundraising campaign for the Project Healing Waters 2 Fly Tournament, Please Google Project Healing Waters 2 Fly Tournament or Project Healing Waters and click the little yellow donate rectangle and give a few dollars. We're going to try and have a large contribution from the listeners of the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast for this tournament, which is held the last weekend of April 2018. Thanks for listening to this one. And I'm sorry you don't get all the visuals that were at the presentation. Thus, a podcast is audio and not visual. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is fly fishing for shad. I consider it the most exciting fly fishing you're going to have with the least amount of skill required. You can be the most skilled angler and do just as well as somebody that's never thrown a fly line before. It's the least technical, most rewarding type of fly fishing. All right, maybe I should have seen how this advanced earlier. Come on. There we go. All right, so we're going to go over a lot of things today. But this is what basically I'm going to talk about. Shad and herring, identification. You catch them. Even experienced anglers sometimes can't tell them apart. People post on social media. They caught one type of fish, and it's actually another. So that's what they look like. There's going to be pictures all throughout this. You're not just going to be fishing for shad. There's other things that are going to be out there swimming around. Crappy, catfish, bluegill. So you've got blue cats, black crappy, largemouth, smallmouth, striped bass, white perch, needlefish, you'll see lampreys, you're going to see American eels, carp, gar might show up. And there's always something bigger than the shad down below. And it's like a box of chocolates. You don't know what you have until the fish comes to the surface. And if you do it enough, you can tell the type of fish based on the fight. But you're going to get into all of these. It, these are just what my clients have gotten into in the last couple of years. If you target needlefish or gizzard shad, you take those off the hook yourself. I'm not dealing with them. Needlefish bite. They can turn themselves in a full circle. So if you grab the tail, they'll turn around and bite you. All right. So why fish for shad? Well, they're coming up the river to spawn, and they're dropping millions of eggs, millions upon millions. So everything else is eating those minnows, bluegills, everything else. So these shad, they're not biting your fly to kill it. If you're a bass or another type of predatory fish and you want to kill another fish, you do a head kill. You, you hit them in the head and that kills them. It stuns them. You go back around and eat them. They're just nipping at them. And I'll get into this in detail later. But these shad are nearby. It's what, eight or nine miles to chain bridge from here. The quantity of them is like nothing you are going to come across fishing anything else around here or pretty much anywhere else that you're going to fish. They fight. They're strong. These fish are used to swimming against ocean currents, being chased by dolphins and who knows what else. 
they jump, they bulldog. You can catch 100 fish in a day. If it's good and you're doing things right, it's not technical. You're not matching a hatch. I'm not throwing a size 20 zebra midge to something that's sipping to one fish. I'm throwing a fly or two flies to 300 fish at once. The chance of one of them biting it is pretty good. Also, you've got the bird watching. Osprey yesterday was out. You'll see bald eagles, terns. What are the, the ones that hang out under bridges and barns? I guess those are swallows. I've seen turkeys down there. There's deer, there's foxes. Unfortunately, now there's a lot of vultures. 10, 15 years ago, you'd see more blue herons in a day than you've seen in your entire life. There's something else, if you are taking notes, write down shad cam. That's something that's in, uh, it's in a dam in Richmond, and you can watch fish swim up through that dam uh, 24 hours a day once the cameras turn on and the water's clear. When that's hot and there's a lot of fish going, give it about two to three weeks, and up here, it'll be on fire. And finally, I'm predicting all of you are going to come down with the shad flu in about five weeks, and you're not going to make it into the office. It's contagious, and you're going to have to get up early to, uh, to beat it. So I'm going to cover tonight. Shad, what are they? When did they evolve? Where did they evolve? Description of each species of fish you're targeting. I'm going to go over the spawning aspect because that's why they're here. Where to find them, when to find them, how to fish for them, and techniques. Locations. This is geared towards the Potomac because it's right down the street from here. The gear and flies. And there is definitely a shopping list. Art has laid out all the things you need to catch. There's some specific gear, but you might already have that. If not, we can go over it tonight. So what are shad? Shad are animals, so kingdom five class, order, family, genus, species. Actinopterygii, those are the ray fin fishes, and you can just see that there's lines in the, their fins. They're clupeiformes, and the family is clupeidae, or clupeidae. Anything that ends in I-D-A-E in animals is the family. We're um, hominids, hominidae. Subfamily, Alosinae, which is the genus Alosa. And then we're also going to talk about Dorosomantiae, which you don't really want to catch. Those are the Dorosomantids or the gizzard shad. Gizzard shad are just, they're like Jawas. Nobody likes them except seagulls that eat them when they're dead on shore. Uh, and you, you won't catch any of these fish unless you know all those Latin names. <laughs> It helps. <laughs> All right, so the history. If you were to go to Great Falls right now, you would find a 1,500-year-old petroglyph of shad. And I'll show you a picture of it. It's carved in the rocks, and it's interpreted to show a spot where the shad used to come up. Uh, there's a discussion on TPFR right now about how far up these fish go currently. Back in the day, it was Great Falls. And the stripers would go up there. The stripers used to be this big and they would just scoop them out with nets. So these things came up, you know, 55 million years ago, and the picture of this shad looks like that. This is the actual carving, and that's an interpretation. And I, I want to go find it at some point. I don't know where it is, but in my research over the last couple of years, I have found that. And the Algonquins were the people that lived here way back in the day. Some of the terms in this are going to be Algonquian, I believe, Potomac. In Algonquian means river of swans. The three sisters rocks, that's an Algonquian legend of the three sisters that drowned. If you take a boat up to Fletcher's from Gravel, you'll pass the three sisters. Here's some historic pictures. 1893, shad planking or a barbecue. Shad have been part of the culture in Washington, D.C. for a long time. As long as people have been living here, they've been eating shad. And back then... The stories were that you could just go down the frying pan and just scoop up as many as you needed. So the history continued. We're talking mass numbers, and they come up after winter when the river should be unfrozen. And we're going to go into the metabolism of shad and why they come up at a certain time. So Algonquian, it translates to inside-out porcupine due to their bones. I've never eaten a shad. And you can't really unless you have a permit. So I don't know what the inside of a shad looks like, but apparently they're very bony. Goes back to Captain John Smith. He went all the way up to Chain Bridge in his boat. They said he could see all the way to the bottom. The water was that clear back then. 
And people, once they colonized, started just taking more than the natives did, which is why we still don't have that many fish today. In the 1830s, 4,000 shad per haul. They would go out with seine nets, just go across the river, and they would pull in 20-foot sturgeon, 60-inch stripers, and as many herring and shad as possible with no thought about future generations. Back then, that's just how they did things. And then at the last century, the water quality got really bad. There was polio, which was bad for humans, but you had all the raw sewage, agricultural, plus industrial revolution. So the Potomac got pretty gross, which made it inhospitable for fish to migrate up and to spawn, and for their young to be viable. So the fish have come back. The problem now are dams. There are physical and geographical barriers for these fish to reach their spawning grounds. If you go down to Richmond, you've got Bosher's Dam. If you go down to Fredericksburg, you had Embry Dam. And as soon as Embry Dam was taken out about 15 years ago, the next season, shad were caught up near the brook trout streams in Madison County. So they will go that far. They will go, you'll see them at four mile run trying to swim up the sewage outflow. These fish just go as high as possible. The ones on the Delaware swim all the way up to Delaware Water Gap, which is where the rainbow trout fishing is, where Art does his 301 classes. They will eat dry flies up there after they spawn. So I think that's pretty cool. Maybe a bucket list, go up and try and catch an American shad on a size 14K hill dry fly. And they go so far up there, they're eventually going to run out of their fat reserves. So there's a lot of death of these fish up there. And the Occoquan, before the dams were built, those fish used to swim all the way up to Dulles Airport. So there are historic runs that these fish used to take, and they can't anymore. Here in D.C., Little Falls is the geographical barrier for them. Some gizzards get into the canal. There are fish ladders that aren't really useful. I've never seen any of these species above Little Falls in my entire life. So if they get up there, I don't know where they're going. And to go back to history, this is Google map of the Route 1 bridge in Fredericksburg. And right here, you can see these from Google Earth. These are fish weirs that date back to when this was inhabited by Native Americans. And what they would do is just corral fish in there, block it off, and net them. And if you stand on the bridge, you can look down and see those still to this day. That's how important shad were. And I didn't know about shad. Honestly, I went into Orvis across the street my junior year of college to get some tie material. I was going to Puerto Rico for spring break. And they said, oh, you got some colorful stuff. Are you going shad fishing? And I really didn't know what they were talking about. And then junior and senior year, I got into shad fishing in Fredericksburg. And Fredericksburg used to put on a whole shad fest, big hurrah, big thing to do. That's a great spot, but we're going to focus on the Potomac. Some more historic photos from way back in the day. These are from the website Shorpy, S-H-O-R-P-Y. It's got really cool old photos of D.C. You can go look at the Miss Cherry Blossom at the Tidal Basin Bikini Contest in the 20s. And when I say bikini, it was like knee to shoulder. And then shad planking, that's the traditional way to eat them. This was taken at Fletcher's. There's a guy down there who has a federal permit to collect them. So this was the traditional way to cook them. You Nail them to a board and slowly smoke them, and the fat drips off, keeps the fire going. And the roe is also apparently very good. You can get the roe in stores and restaurants. That has to come from Georgia. All right, let's talk about these fish. So we're talking about herring and shad, menhaden. Really, only herring and shad are going to be up here, and they're basically the sardines of the Potomac River. They're going to be torpedo-shaped, so they can swim through the water fast without burning a lot of calories. So laterally compressed, and the hickory shad are going to be more side-to-side -side flat than the American shad. Head without scales, and notice, teeth small or minute, if present at all. These fish do not use their mouths to bite things. They have very soft mouths. They swim around with their mouth open, and they collect water to oxygenate their lungs, and then they have gill rakers to separate the plankton when they're 200 feet down in the ocean. So when they're biting your fly, it's very soft. You're going to lose fish regardless if you've got a barb or not. It's either going to pull through or just pop out. You're going to lose a lot of fish, but you're still hooking fish, hopefully every couple of casts. Single dorsal fin will help you differentiate them from other fish. 
and their scales are kind of roundish, very shiny, and they're going to pop off and cover you everywhere. If you drop one, as they flop around, scales all over the place. And important for uh, commercial fishing, you can read the new Omega principle book by Paul Greenberg about why you should be not eating fish for oils because it's just a waste. But they're ground up for fish meal, gizzard shad of no commercial value. If you catch one, take it home and bury it in your garden. The river's not going to miss them. There's plenty. So the alosas are going to be the shad we're fishing for. Alosa sapidissima and the hickory shad alosa medicyris. We also have the river herring, which you're not going to be able to distinguish with the naked eye. Blueback herring and alewives, and we'll go into depth in these. These are schooling fish, deeper bodied than other members of their family, and you're going to notice spots may be found behind the head. And they all smell, they're slimy, they're stinky fish. So the Dorosomas are going to be your gizzard shads, slimier, smellier, again, no commercial value. And if you're fishing the D.C. shoreline above Chain Bridge, they will stack up in schools where you can't see anything but gizzard shad. People will just go in there and snag them for fun. I don't know why you would do that, because you still have to take them off and somehow physically touch them to get the hook out. Again, if a client targets them on purpose, they can unhook them themselves. I'm not touching them. So we're going to go over migratory fish. These are diadromous anadromous fish. They're swimming up from the ocean to spawn in fresh water, and then they leave alive if they don't die from malnourishment or exhaustion. And the reason they're swimming up is because the young and adults live on two different types of food, just like a butterfly and a caterpillar. So the food, the food that these juveniles need is found upstream in the headwaters. Little zooplankton, little daphnia, little mosquito larva, all the little itty things that trout are going to eat too that don't exist in the ocean. And there are more predators in the ocean, so they adapted to swim upstream, spawn, and return. So there's more Latin. Diadromous means running through, and nadrous means running up. These are going to be like your steelhead. And it's the opposite of other fish. Some fish go out to the ocean to spawn, like eels, and then they swim back up to freshwater. So where are you going to find shad, besides me just telling you they're down the street? So every spring, this is the key question, when are the shad in? The shad are going to be in when the river's in the low 40s. They're not going to spawn until it's in the upper 50s. Their eggs and sperm cannot viably create an embryo if the water is too cold. So they will sit and do nothing and just hang out until the water gets warmer. So they're probably in there. The herring are already in there. They've been in the river for at least three weeks that I've seen. And I saw an osprey yesterday, so we're getting close. People are like, ah, i seen cormorants. There are cormorants that live here all winter. You drive by Roaches Run, and they're sitting on the branches, and they're sitting on the docks all over the wharf right now. When you see big flocks of cormorants flying over the bridges in D.C., and the rocks start turning white from all the guano, from the nitrogen, from the fish, then you know it's on. I know these fish are coming. I'm in no rush. I'm going to enjoy a little peace and quiet because I know the craziness is coming. And they're going to go as far as physically possible, so that's up by Chain Bridge for us. There's really not much farther, and I'll get into that spot specifically in a moment. And the river specific. They've tried stocking these fish in other streams up and down the coast that have been depleted, and they don't take off as well. I don't know if those fish are going to swim back to the river they were born in if they're a hatchery fish. And that's just the whole problem with hatchery fish. And then the eggs and hatch, and they're going to stay in the river, and you will see them in the fall. If you go down to Four Mile Run or Roaches Run, you're just going to see schools. You'll think it's raining. The water's all dimpled, but you look up and it's a blue sky. And then you look closely and there's itty bitty little minnow sized fish just flipping out of the water everywhere. Those are the baby shad that are eating all the zooplankton. You can catch them. Drift a little pheasant tail or zebra midge through. You can catch little itty bitty fish. And when I fish for stripers in the fall, my patterns all mimic the baby shad. Go down to Gravelly Point in October. You will see schools of these. This is what I consider the bell curve of shad fishing. Right now, we're not even to Peter Pan. So it's going to increase slowly, slowly. You're going to have a huge run. Everyone's out fishing. The weather's nice. 
start catching fewer and fewer fewer fish. And then by the time you get to Tarzan, you know, the bass are done spawning. You can go down and start fishing for gar and largemouth and other spots. That's my uh, analogy for when the fish are in the river. Let's see what these fish look like. There's an artist's interpretation of an American shad. And if I had the laser pointer, I could show you. So the key characteristics, and I'll go over these, are the mouth. It's completely flat right here. The lips meet together. And you've got a deeper body. The tail is not going to be as forked. And the scale patterns are going to be more of a diamond shape, sort of like that. You look at American and the hickory side by side, obviously there's a difference. But when you're catching them and you get a huge hickory, people think it's an American. Ooh, all right. Some pictures of Americans. You'll notice that, to me, they look like giant minnows they're going to have a little bit more pinkish yellows to them and again that mouth is you can see how thin it is right here it's just a thin membrane it's not made for picking and grabbing on things it's made just to be open and compared to the hickory pictures i'm going to show you these are much bigger you're going to catch fewer americans from shore than you will if you're on a boat so american shad also known as the white shad Translates to the most delicious fish. If you read John McPhee's book, The Founding Fish, he'll go into detail about how this fish saved the troops during the Revolutionary War when they were starving. And I'm going up to the, I guess it's called the Shully Kill, Shull Kill, in two weeks. So I'm going to see if there's any shad up there. Again, these are the biggest of the shad. When you hook into a row female, it can go six to seven pounds. These fish might take several minutes to land. Four to five minutes, sorry, four to five years in the ocean, they come back and they might spawn two to three times. Again, silvery fish, dark spots along the side. You're usually going to see just one big spot. It's the color of the scales, the shape of the scales, and that terminal mouth that are going to differentiate them from other fish. And again, they're plankton eaters. We don't have plankton in the Potomac River. These fish are not eating in the river. They're biting out of aggression. You go ahead and throw a plankton fly and see if it works, but they're like salmon. They're living off their fat reserves. They are not consuming food. They're going to come up and spawn. Lots of eggs. Lots of eggs in the water means lots of things eating them. This is a smorgasbord for other fish. You will see more types of small minnows in the river this time of year than any other time because they're eating all those eggs, which are dispersed just out in the water column. They're going to do this at the surface. You're going to hear sounds like this, which is the fish coming to the surface, releasing eggs, and then the males fight to fertilize them. There's no parental care. They release their eggs, and they're gone. Sunfishes, bass, largemouth, smallmouth, sunfish, bluegill, they all guard nests. These fish, it's just wham, bam, and they're done. They're going to look for specific spawning areas, preferably if there's higher water, maybe a flood tide or just higher tides in a flood. They're, they want specific types of gravel and grasses that they can go lay their eggs on, which are then going to go downstream and find a nook and cranny where the embryo is going to develop and then attach into a larvae. Larvae are going to feed, grow up, and again, leave the river and fall. You can go to the tidal basin in October go striper fishing and it's pointless because all you can see are baby shad. The water in there is very calm. There's no current and they stack up in there and I've gone and tried to fish it and you can't even get your fly through them to find a fish below because you end up snagging babies all the time. So the hickory shad, this is what you're going to catch the most. Notice cash register jaw. Draw a line there. The mandible sticks out. When the mouth is closed, this maxillary bone will be behind the eye. Key defining characteristic when you catch it. They're going to be more squashed or pancaked. And they come in three sizes. Small, medium, and large. The large ones, you're going to need a net to land, especially if you're on shore. That tail is much more forked. Fork-tailed fishes are strong swimmers, which means they're strong fighters. And when you get 75, 80 of those in a day, you're going to be exhausted. And then you can go home and say, why do people 
fly out west and go up north and everywhere else in the country to fish, you're going to catch more fish in the Potomac on a good day than you're going to do anywhere else in the country. About, oh, there's some pictures. There. Oh, look, where's, uh, where's Dan? Is Dan still here, Art? Look. There you go. So th those are hickories. And notice, again, there's that mandible. You can't see with the mouth open, but it should be behind the eye. You've got underbite, more distinct spots, and the body is not as drooping down. They don't have a big belly. And if you read the article in the post about us, that's podcast producer Jason. There are no real good pictures of me holding Shad, so they used his picture. And that's Yoshi in the back. He showed up with a five-weight Winston with 8X tippet, and he's like, dude, just put it away. Grab one of mine. So Jason comes down here every year, and we take my boat up to Fletcher's, and it's fun. I don't guide from the boat up there. It's all shore fishing. So when I get that one opportunity a year to go up my boat, I take advantage of it. And notice big net right there. Just, you never know what you're going to pull out. So these fish... We go over the shopping list later. Uh, sun gloves. I consider those very important. The belly of these fish is serrated, so the scales are going back like the shingles on your roof. And if you're holding them and they move, they're going to stab you in your hand. So if you get stabbed in the hand, you probably have a hickory, not an American. Again, forked tail, lower jaw. Same thing. Difference is these jump. Poor man's tarpon. So you're going to feel them. You know, They're going to be shaking the head, and then all of a sudden... They come up, flip, and land. If you've got two fish on at the same time that are going to flip, it's crazier if you've got a shad and a striper on. That fight is going to be awesome. Spawning is not too different. Again, look at that temperature range. 54 to 72. The river now is too cold. There's probably some fish up there, but they're not active enough to chase your fly. They're not willing to. If they're not spawning, why are they going to chase a minnow? That would be eating their eggs. Again, externally fertilized, and uh, I believe that these last longer in the Potomac. The Americans go out first, and then these larvae stick around a little bit longer. Peak spawning temperature, 59 to 66. I like 63 and above. I'm not taking clients out until that water is in the mid-60s. It's not worth their time. If we're going out, I don't want three or four fish in a several-hour period. I want three or four fish in two casts. So let's break it down. I did this at a traffic light today. Some of the uh, character characteristics, if you want to see them, it's the mouth, the size, the mandibles. American shad are going to be deeper. They're going to be going in the ruts and troughs where they can school up. And when they school up, it means they don't have to extend as much energy, and somehow the oxygen flows easily through their gills and they can breathe better. So schooling up in deep water is beneficial for them. Uh, gill rakers. I have a picture looking down at American Shad's mouth. I couldn't find it. And it looks like Venetian blinds closed. It's just row, 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 row. And that's just for filtering. It just pulls things out of the water as they swim. It's kind of creepy looking down their mouth. And the difference again, jumping versus going deep. When we have an American on, we usually think it's a catfish because it just hangs out at the bottom. Let's talk about river herring. So they're called river herring because to the naked eye, they're indistinguishable. The two places you'll see the most of these are the tidal basin and Roach's Run. I'll go down to Roach's Run and fish for them with a Tenkara rod. It's fun. So alewives and blueback herring, collectively known as river herring, None of these species can be removed from the water. If you see anybody taking herring or shad, call the cops. I'll have the number later. They stack up along the wall of Tidal Basin. So you go down there, and you just notice all the tourists are doing this. And they see with a fishing rod, they're like, hey, there's fish here. I know. They will swim that entire four-leaf clover shape in circles. You look down, and from the wall to about a foot out is nothing but herring as far as you can see. And they just swim in circles around the edge. They got, you'll get so many questions asked down there. I had a huge hickory shad eat a clouser. I was fishing for snakehead. 
big old clouser, like a size one hook. I don't know how it got hooked. Uh, let's see. So you go to the Latin names. Alewife just means fake herring. They're smaller. Uh, you'll foul hook these a lot down at Chain Bridge. They're just schools of them, and they're going to be at your feet. They're going to be splashing around. Let's see. Uh, this is not, yeah. So against what they do is they push the females up against the rocks. The females will release their eggs. The males fertilize them, and that's when people are trying to scoop them up. They go up all the creeks. I've seen them go up culverts, ditches. Like I said, they go up four-mile run outflow. They are interesting little fish. I got pictures of them swimming around our feet. That's what it looks like when they're spawning. And that is with 35-millimeter camera looking straight down. That's the mouth of Pimmit Run. And probably 20 fish right there just schooling up, eggs, fertilized. It happens all day long. Now we got gizzard shad, also known as mud shad, jawas, disgusting. Characteristic of this one, like a tarpon, it's got the thread fin. Their eyes are big and horizontal pupil, rounded mouth. You'll see them in the tidal basin all summer, just picking at the wall. They'll eat flies, and you'll get them this big. I mean, it's a good fight. It's, they're just disgusting. So again, uh, and they're not true shad, just a different family. Thread fin, strange eyes. You'll see them when it floods. We're talking when the river's eight, nine feet. They will go into the flooded coves and stack up where I've seen people just go with nets and buckets and just pull them out. You can buy them in Korean grocery stores. If you look up gizzard shad on Instagram, it's all Korean dishes. So they, they've got to be eating them. And you can just go down to Chain Bridge and just watch the flooded shorelines. As far as you can see, it's just gizzard shad. Go to my YouTube. I have videos of it, and it's crazy. All right. There's nothing on my screen at the moment. Don't get the cheapest laptop when you go there. I think we're there. No. All right. So I mentioned shad eggs. That's what a shad egg looks like. So one of my theories when I'm tying my flies, you also got the bead chain right here. It's the same size. Think of an egg-sucking leech. Maybe that looks like a cluster of eggs in a minnow's mouth. So maybe they'll you know, hit those a little more aggressively. And their, their eggs are sticky. So I know uh, Dino, the dog from Fletcher's, used to go swimming and come out covered in eggs. Modern technology. There we go. My computer's got a couple of infections as well been hanging out with gizzard shad too much. All right, so where are you going to find these fish? The fall line. And you're going to notice all the major old-time towns in Virginia are along the fall line. This is your fall line right here. D.C., Fredericksburg, Richmond, and this is where the shad go. You fish with it at the fall line. It's where the river goes from wide and deep to narrow. They built all the cities there because that's where all the ports were. Follow that. And when I said they swam up to Madison County, I'm talking like this is the Piedmont right here. So when they took out the dam, the trout were, or the, the shad were swimming all the way up there. They were catching stripers miles and miles away from Fredericksburg. So the Potomac River, pretty much little falls to Windy Run. Windy Run is just below Fletcher's. Both sides of the river, your national parks will leave your guns and booze and fire-making stuff at home. Again, all these fish need to be released because you're in D.C. and have to go by D.C. regulations. Two fly maximum. You can't do three flies at once. You go down to Fredericksburg and do that. You need a D.C. license for both sides of the river. I don't care what shore you're I should say I don't care. U.S. Park Police don't care what side of the river you on, as long as you have a DC license that's visible. Out of state, 13 bucks for the year. You're not gonna get a better license. Uh, yeah, so that's the number for the cops. And Officer Kim comes to Beer Tie. You can always ask her questions. If you're out, I like guiding for the Virginia side because I'm in the shade most of the day. If you're out on the boat or you're on shore on the DC side, you're exposed to the wind and the sun all day, it will drain you. So remember to wear your buff, big hat, hydrate, gloves, sunblock, all of that. And then once the, the leaves come in, we're sitting in the shade all day, nice little breeze. 
I'm perfectly comfortable in my spot. So here is what I'm talking about. You've got Fletcher's. So that, that this is the bottom of the cove right here. And we're talking, you can, you can pretty much fish up to about here on shore. And I'm going to break down some of the hot spots. But this is your DC shad fishing location. If you were to walk up the canal, either from the bridge, you've got a parking lot right here, or you can park at Fletcher's and walk. Chain bridge, five minutes if you walk at a general pace. If you're first left, you go down this concrete walkway, we call it the alien platform. It's just a giant concrete slab. People picnic there, you gotta watch them on your back cast. That is a phenomenal spot to stand on the rocks and fish. Producer Jason almost lost an entire fly line that day hooking to a fish. It got out in that current and it was gone. So this is the alien platform, again, big concrete. I jump the wall right here. This is all really good fishing. And when I get into where these shad are going to be, these are, they're not lazy fish, they're smart fish. They don't want to swim in the fast water. Fast water here. You're going to have kayakers coming down. See that foam line? They're going to be right on the edge of that. So the water's coming down, and this is slack water all through here. So they can school up, do their thing, not burn extra calories. So either side of a rock outcropping, you're going to be finding these fish stacked up. But these nooks and crannies where the gizzards are going to be. You'll find gizzards right in that hole. Just, it's just tails and fins sticking out of the water. How many people die right here? Uh, we get about two dozen deaths. Yeah, two dozen deaths between Great Falls and Georgetown a year, the Mather Gorge. Uh, Jason and I were, it was the day he almost got spooled. We were walking, across, we were parking, and there's helicopters right above the bridge. Oh, like, that's not good. And we get down there, and there's a whole family, and there's park officers all up and down the shoreline. And we get there, and on one of the rocks, there's a rod and a bucket and a tackle box and no angler. And they called off the search about an hour after we got there. Like four or five weeks later, they found his body in Georgetown, and they had these dental records. He just fell in, he just slipped off a rock. Stay dry if you go there. Yeah. It's, all, it's technically illegal to be wet entering the Potomac from a national park. And my instructions are no wet feet. I was in a tide pool. I was fishing. Tide comes up. A cop's, cop comes down the hill, says, son, you're in the river. Get out. And I'm like, uh, I'm maybe like this deep. Very shallow. And I was like, well, I'm not really in the river. He goes, you're wet. Get out. or I'm writing you a ticket. All right, I'm not going to argue. I consider there's three different ways to fish for shad. There's shore fishing, there's wade fishing, which is not applicable up here, and then there's boat fishing. Basically, you just have to get your fly to them and then down. So we're going to talk about the gear required and the flies that you need to do that with. And what I'm going to do, let's say the water's flowing this way. I'm going to throw my fly out and across, maybe up, and I'm going to let it swing and sink in the current. And these fish will absolutely hit a fly on the swing. So you can cast out, boom. What I do is throw it out, you know, look at the birds, helicopters. And then once it gets down, I start stripping and popping my rod. And when I strip, I'm going to be wearing these finger guards where I'm taping up my fingers or I'm wearing sun gloves. If you strip hard enough and fast enough, you're going to burn your index finger. You're also going to be hooking a shad. And if the water's clear enough, you'll see the hickories. Everyone says you need to go deep. These hickories can be caught six inches under the surface. That deep. So you lay it out, pop, pop, pop. And you'll see them go like this. It's, if you've ever seen underwater pictures of tuna destroying a bait ball, the way they swim up or turn to the side, it's exactly what these fish are going to do. Your two variables when fishing for shad are going to be the depth of the water and the speed of the retrieve. So where in the water column are these fish going to be? You're going to have Americans deeper down and then hickories kind of all throughout the water column. So depending on what species you want to catch, you can let your fly sink deeper. It also sort of helps to know how deep you are. If you're in a boat, you can drop your anchor and know how deep you are. If you're on shore, it's probably 20 to 30 feet, not too far out. And when my clients say, where should I throw my fly? I'll pick up a rock the size of a grapefruit. 
I see, see that little swirling eddy? They're like, eh, I'm not sure. I'll toss it out there, pick up the fly rod, hit the water where the, the rock just rippled, and I could be on a fish. A falling rock in the water doesn't scare them. If you do that to a raising, rising trout, you're never gonna catch a trout. You can throw rocks in the water and it does not scare these fish. If you set the hook too hard, you're gonna rip it out. And if you fight them and pop your rod too much, if there's any slack, it's gonna fall right out of their mouth. You need to know and understand the tides in DC because the water goes up and down three feet per day, more so when you have a full moon. Full moon's gonna make the tides a little more extreme. I like to fish the outgoing tide. What it does for me is it allows, when you have the high tide, the fish are all spread out. Low tide, they're a little more concentrated, so there's less water to fish with more fish in it. And then as the tide drops, we can step down on rocks and find easier places and more places to stand. Be careful that these rocks are gonna be super slick because there's a thin film of mud on all of them. So if you step in the water just to move around and you, you're gonna slide. Or if you wait for the tide to drop and the slime doesn't dry, you're gonna fall and bust yourself. You can look at tide charts online, just Google tide chart DC. You'll find one for one mile below Fletcher's Cove, and then you'll actually find one for at Fletcher's Cove. And that'll give you an idea of what the tides are doing. Remember the boats at Fletcher's can't really get out now at low tide because the cove is filled in with mud. And my website should have links for all these tides. I've got a, a nerd watch, so I've got tides on there. And you can get tide apps for your phone. They're on there. I could just do that, and I got tides for DC. It's also on the Orvis website. I update the title section for Orvis every week, and there's a tide chart for the week for DC. Now you gotta find the fish. So I mentioned where they're gonna be. They're gonna be deep down, and then I like that slack water on the outside of a moving rock. And these fish wanna take the path of least resistance, so they're gonna be going through those deep troughs. And as you can see here, we're deep down in the blue, and this is where they're gonna be swimming. So if the river's shaped kinda of like this, you know, this being the deepest section, this is the shores up here, and I have a picture to show this. That would be the picture I'm trying to show. <laughs> Cross section of a river. That shows you the deep troughs. You'll notice in Fletcher's, all the boats are gonna be lined up in a specific spot. And when you're on one of those boats, be considerate and let other people go near you. Everybody on those row boats wants a 60 foot radius around their boat that they don't want anybody to go in. And if you go through it, they're gonna give you nasty looks. They're gonna mutter things under your breath. Just drop your rod. And if you're fishing downstream, don't yell at me if I'm going over here. And I'm not taking your fish. There's more fish in there than any of us can possibly catch. And yeah, I get the stink eye from people when I'm motoring through there with my trolling motor. I don't get it. All right. Uh, I mentioned that they're schooling fish. They're also low light fish. These fish are used to be very deep down in the ocean. And now they're coming up into shallower water. They also have very big eyes that they can't focus based on sunlight. Our eyes... Retinas, they'll open and close based on the light. These fish are always swimming like this. They're not going to want to be at the surface. There is too much light up there. So a nice cloudy, overcast day, you probably do better. And then deeper water or water that's a little off color. Uh, yeah, covered all that. So the water levels, it's called action stage. It's five feet. And you can go to... Advanced hydrographs by NOAA for the river or the USGS site. I, I can get you those easily. And they just show you the NOAA website tells you what the river is at that moment and what it's going to be for the next five or six days. So you can look at it and it might just be three feet, three feet, three feet. And all of a sudden, on five days from now, it's predicting that it's going to go like that because there may be a huge storm that's coming over the mountains. It's a huge drainage and a lot of water comes through. You wonder why there's trees, giant dead trees, up in the trees around the cove? It's because they get there from floods. 
You want to know what the water is. If it's above five feet, there's nowhere to stand. The water is going to be stained off color. It's no good. Fletcher's does not row boat, rent boats if it's at five feet. And you can just tell that by the river gauge. I like it around three feet on an outgoing tide when it hasn't rained in about seven or eight days. To me, that's ideal. That's when the water's crystal clear and I'm looking at my feet and I've seen little baby snakes go by all day long. The herring come through. And that's your best chance of seeing a snakehead. When you're on those rocks, you look down, there could be a 30-inch snakehead at your feet. The problem is this whole stretch of river is full of snaggers. Call them in. They're going to have catfish rods with rope, and they're dangling off that a one-ounce treble hook. So when the snakeheads come up to breathe, they lower the line over, hook them in the gut, and drag them up. So that cove by the alien platform, if you're trying to get in there and there's snakehead snaggers, call it in. Describe them, tell them where you are, take pictures, whatever you got to do. Fish and wildlife should be down there themselves this year. Next thing is water temperature. Here's another graph. This is on the USGS site. It measures the temperature of the water at Little Falls at different depths. And you can see when it's 40s and 50s, stay at home. Go fish, go trout fish, go to Big Honey Creek or Beaver. When it starts getting around the 60s, 65, 62, that's when the shad flu is going to kick in. You're going to get the fever, and you're going to have to go shad fishing. When it reaches upper 60s, it's going to be on fire. That's when the schoolies are going to be in, the needlefish, the gar start showing up. You're going to be seeing quillbacks eating rising caddis all over. You're going to see fish just popping. Like I said, you'll see more fish in one day than you've seen in your entire life out there in a good day. Cormorants coming down. Those cormorants will pop up right under your rod and scare you. They come up, bah, bah, and they got these red eyes and black beaks. And also, my buddy Morgan watched them pooping on a guy. He was standing on a, on a rock, and he kept, like, doing that. And Morgan was, there were ten of them above him, and they just kept squirting. And he never looked up. They were on his rock. Those birds, well, we saw one guy last year. He was striper fishing, and he He's setting his hook on his big rod up in the fast water where its big stripers hang out. This cormorant comes up. It starts flapping its wings. It's got a chartreuse plug in its shoulder. And he released the bird. He got down there and held it and took the hook out. Actually, uh, he's got a picture of that bird on his phone right now. We have one go after our shad guards, and he ended up reeling them in. We had to throw a blanket over his head and untangle That's a sharp beak. I don't want to mess with them. They're like the avian version of the gizzard chat. I did the cross section of the river. All right, let's talk about gear. Uh, you got plenty of rods back here. I like a five weight, medium to fast action. If I'm on shore, I'm roll casting. There's nowhere on shore for me to lay line out and shoot out a long cast. If you're in a boat, fish whatever you want. You can even fish fiberglass rods out there. You're going to get tired fighting these fish, but I want medium to fast action, five to nine weight. Or sorry, five to eight weight. Nine feet long maybe a switch rod if you want to throw some lines farther i generally do it all with a nine foot five weight and i'll take six weights out there some of mine are nine and a half feet long which just gives you an extra roll cast if you think of it three four five triangle if you extend this axis your line the hypotenuse can be longer so you get a longer roll cast and then we'll have eight weights just in case we start seeing snakeheads or stripers or if i'm just running out of rods if we start breaking five weights, i got to start using the eights. Rod breaks more rounds. It's not, it's my line. No, last year I had, I had a brand new rod, and I was pulling it out. It was sitting in my car, and I was pulling my net out. And the bag of the net caught the reel handle, and because I was parked on a hill, the car door closed and broke the rod in half. It still had the plastic on the cord. I had just opened it the day before. Uh, we don't. It's more of the damage of my clients dropping reels. Out. It's all rocks, so people put them down and ding them up. Um, always bring extra rods with you. Rod likes to redeem that for this <laughs> when I did Groupon, it was it was like five rods a week. I was down to the rod I got from my bar mitzvah that I was using for people. I had one guy break a rod in half. I was just like, all right, thanks. Just, same with I had a client at Chain Bridge who sunk through my $80 net in the water and watched it float away. And the dad was like, sorry about the net. Uh, for real, you can go ahead and use a click and paw, put your hand on it to slow it down. 
but there's always something bigger out there. And if you, even the small fish are going to pull line off the reel. If you hook something bigger, you're really going to need it. If they get in the fast current, you need a solid drag. So large arbor can hold. That's what I use. You don't need more than 100 yards of back. If a fish goes out that far, you're screwed anyway. You're not going to be chasing these fish up and down the shoreline. Your line. Uh, Art's got them out here. Those three types of fishing, if you're on shore, I prefer sink tip line because you're not fishing that deep. You're not fishing that far. And if you start daydreaming with a full sinking line, it's just going to get caught up in the rocks and who knows what else is down there. If you're out in a boat and you're in really deep water, you need a fast sinking line. So 350 grain is the number one seller, depth charge? Uh, 250, right here. 250 and 350. Depending yeah. on the size of the rod. I have a six weight rod I right. throw my 250 with. Right. And yeah. these lines will zip out. I'll I mean, they're, it's like they're completely greased. And you can shoot line. If you're in a boat, you can just drop your fly over, shake the line out. Let it go downstream and then just start stripping. You don't even need to cast it. It could be just bloop. The fish are going to be everywhere when you're out in a boat. So don't worry that you're not able to throw 80 feet of fly line. That's fun and all. It's great, but these fish, sometimes they're not more than a liter distance away from you. We caught them next to the outboard last year. I was just talking. Just fly in the water, talking to Jason, and their fish swimming right by the outboard on the boat. Uh, so bolt, I like full sink. If you're waiting, like Fredericksburg, a sink tip is nice. You can always get away with the poly sink tips. Those are nice too. But I'm also going to be throwing some heavier flies to help facilitate me sink down. Shooting heads are awesome. I have the bank shot. You can just false cast that and launch it. Again, if you're out of boat, it's 30 bucks to rent it all day. You can also bring your own boat down there and put in. If you're casting all day long, with a sinking line, it's going to get tiring. So have the rod and the line that are going to make the amount, least amount of effort on your end. Leaders, again, these fish have never seen a human. If they're not scared from rocks falling in, in their heads, they're not too concerned. You can go ahead and just use super strong for them. If you want to target some of the more trickier species, the snakehead are mixed in. If you want to target quillbacks or some stripers, that's when you're going to want to throw some fluorocarbon. For most instances, if the water's muddy, you're fine. Um, I build my own leaders because we go through so many of them. You don't need a tapered leader because they're just longer. And if you're using a sinking line, all you need is two feet of straight tippet to your first fly and then a foot of tippet to your next fly. Zero to two X is fine. I can't say anything down there's broken my line. A guy three years ago hooked a shad, had a striper eat it. And that broke his rod, but not his line. Um, if I'm building my own leaders, Did he have a five I don't know. <laughs> you hear rods cracking all the time, spinning rods, and yeah, especially the snaggers because they're bringing them in at awkward angles, and spinning rods blow up on them all the time. If I'm building a leader, I'm just using cheap mono, uh, nothing fancy. It'll be 20 pound, and I use the amnesia line. It's about this color, orange, 40 pound. I have about two feet of that sticking out, so my clients know when to roll cast. When they bring up and see that orange line, they know the leader's next, lift the fly up to the surface and pop it out. Sinking lines and heavy flies, you can't roll cast just by doing that. One cast to get the flies up through the water, second to launch it. And I'll have 20 pounds, about this much, to my jig fly, and then I will have 10 pounds maybe to my second fly. I'm always gonna have I, I have lots of other flies, but I'm always, always going to have the damsel. There's something about that fly that catches more fish during the shad run than anything else. Uh, additional gear, hook file. There are so many rocks out there, your hooks are going to get dinged up and bent. Little hook file over there, just keep it sharp. You're going to hook fish easier too if it's nice and sharp. Stripping guards for your fingers. Like I said, you're going to burn them. If you're with me, and I'm yelling at you to strip faster, and when I say that's not fast enough, then you're going to know, and you'll start burning those fingertips. Polarized sunglasses. If you want to see the snakeheads at your feet, polarized glasses. Also, flies and lures are coming back at you. If you hook a tree and you pull it, it's coming right back at you. So we always pull and look away. I don't wear waders down there unless it's raining and just nasty. I'm going to wear wellies, just farm boots. 
it's more comfortable to walk. I don't want to put wear and tear on my waders if I don't have to. My waders are an investment. I'm saving those for steelheading, for other places. I just wear old farm boots. I'm not going in the water. If I'm wearing waders, it's because it's windy and raining and cold. You have to wear a life jacket on the boat. You should have a whistle, whether you're on shore or in a boat, in case someone falls in. Waiting staff is good if you're walking on the shore. When I say that DC shoreline is about as unforgiving as possible, you're going to see why. It's rocks coming up at every angle. Some are slick, just all sorts of stuff. Bring trash bags. If you hook a snakehead and you want to take it home, snakeheads are going to be squirting mucus out of their pores the second you take them out. So all the snakeheads now are trash bags. If you don't get a snakehead, fill it up with everyone's litter from the night before. If only we had a deposit here, I would be. I could have got 200 bucks at Four Mile yesterday. There's so much garbage out there. Five cents per can. All right, I'm going to show you pictures of my flies if this would advance. So Art was nice enough. We got a little shopping list here of flies, gear. I've got the scissor and clamp hemostats picked out. That's what I use for smashing barbs. I smash the barbs at all these fish. It's not for the fish, it's for me. It's a $100 copay for me to get a hook taken out at the hospital. Come on. All right, so flies. I have three tenets of a shad fly. It's got to be an inch long, a short tail, and bright colored, preferably multi-colors in one. So my shad pumps would be a good example of that. It's chartreuse, pink, and silver. And that body is just made out of the red bass thread back there. These flies have to stand out against all the other minnows and other things in the water. I use size 4 and 6 for my streamers. Different flies I tie to get different size hooks. And then my damsel, size 10, shrimp scud hook. Smash the barbs. It's just easier for the fish. And when you catch a, a hickory, they're gonna, all these fish flop around because they've never been motionless in their lives. Flip them over. And they'll just sit, let's do that. You can pop the hook out and drop them back in. I'm always going to use a double fly rig during the shad run. Two different species. The first fly helps get the second one down. If you want to throw a clouser on as your lead fly, that's going to give you a better chance of catching something bigger in the water. The, the strikers are going to need all these regardless. But some of the bigger fish that want a little bit more protein, put on a clouser minnow. Um, and I'm not putting tungsten cones. I'm not using expensive hooks. It's shad fishing. Nothing has to be fancy for them. Spend the money on a good lunch afterwards. So my fly patterns are going to be, first, can you all see that? That's my one 32-ounce shad jig. We just tied those at beer tie. And believe it or not, there's about 10 years of R&D into that little fly. Between weights of the jig body material and tail material. And I like them in pink, chartreuse, and white. And these are great all year round. We'll catch stripers on them in the summer. Next up, always the snow white damsel next. I don't know what it is, but it worked. Another option is my shad puff. It's just big and bright. Stripers eat it, perch eat it, shad eat it, catfish eat it. I tied a couple of those for a guide in the Bahamas for bonefish. Shad Nom Nom, that's my newest one. I don't know if Art has it. What is it called? My Shad Nom Nom. It, it's from the, the meme cake Om Nom Nom. It's a woman on her wedding day and she's just eating cake with both hands. It says cake Om Nom Nom. We tied those at beer tie. The material for that is from Lote. It's for making your own loofahs. And the, there are tutorials for all these on YouTube. Yeah, so Korean loofahs. And notice, three different colors. Pink bead, chartreuse body, silver tail. My shad buster, that is made with the pink or chartreuse bass thread, dumbbell eyes, flash tail, and the body is made out of clear bracelet material from the craft store. 1.5 millimeter stretch magic. And it's just round, and when you lay down your thread underneath it, it makes glow. The stretchy material is clear and it just glows bright. And notice, these are all basically pink, chartreuse, and orange, or a mixture of those. 
Sparkle chenille body fly, that's about as simple if you tie. We did those at uh, the classes here. Just a bright colored chartreuse or pink, just wrapped around. And I'm using number 10 bead chain. You go to Babies R Us, take them off a display. It's what you find on Venetian blinds. You can get that at any hardware store. And then a little clouser, little one inch clouser, I tied out a calf tail. If you know what a calf tail is, it's a baby cow's tail. It's really durable, and I just make it itty bitty, and everything's gonna eat that in the river. And notice the tails are short on all, almost all of these. That's because these are not, the shad are not biting to kill, they're biting to move it out of the way. So they're biting the tail of it, saying, get out of my way. And when they do that, they're eventually gonna bite your hook. Uh, for guided trips, I do only Virginia Shoreline. I can be there as early as 9 a.m. on weekdays. Weekends are pretty much booked through the second week of May. Um, let's see. I provide all gear. So if you don't have rods, reels, or you want to try something to mine out that's different, you're more than welcome to. Use any of my gear. Uh, I'll provide everything up to polarized glasses if you need it. I'm going to tape up your fingers. If my stripping guards are clean, you can catch one fish and they're, they're slimy and ruined. So I have to make sure I take them home every night and wash them. And those are nice and brightly colored, so you can find them in your gear bag. Anything else? Yeah, and I'm not taking people out to that waters in the 60s. And then there's my social media. Uh, this will be on iTunes if you just look up Snow White. There are probably four or five other podcasts about shad. I have got ones just on the shad flies I like to throw. And I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. When you start seeing clients smiling with pictures, that's when you know it's on and it's time to book a trip. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com.